Hello, thank you for joining us. We want to have an interaction, but you can also uh, get an upload of this interaction on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and go search for TV3 Ghana, and then also 92.7 for 3FM on all their socials. But we're here to speak to Dr. Hassan Ayariga, leader of uh, the APC, but also uh, presidential candidate, has had, had uh, vast experiences as an entrepreneur in this country, has lived in, in Europe for a countable number of years, but has a lot of say when it comes to what is topical or not topical in our country. And I have to say that uh, thank you for speaking to us, uh, Dr. Hassan Ayariga. But I, I know that I'm coming to you um, just after you recovering from COVID. Uh, doing well, thank you. I've recovered for the past two two months and one day. Can you tell us your experiences? It's an interesting experience. I had a very bad experience with COVID and I uh, had an interesting one as well. The very bad one was the one I went to Colombo. You know, I didn't even know I had COVID. My wife wasn't well, so we decided to send my wife for a lungs uh, checkup. So we went for them to do an x-ray of her lungs. So when we got there, the doctor asked that, oh, doc, you can also do your own. So I said, okay, let you check both lungs of the two of us. So when they did, we got the results. And my had symptoms of SARS. So the technician told me, doc, you have a symptom of SARS in your results. So you need to go and check for COVID test. Because what we are seeing my, from my experience, you have COVID. I said, okay, no problem. So we went and did a COVID test. We called in the COVID unit and they came and did a test. And I had COVID. So I told my doctor that that's just the case. And the doctor said, okay, buy oximeter, the pulse oximeter, and check for your saturation. So I bought the oximeter. I checked my saturation. My saturation was around 87. And that of my wife was around 99. Then he said, no, 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 yours is bad. You need to go to the hospital quickly. And it was a Sunday. I said, oh, no, let's wait. Monday, I will come to the hospital. He said, no, no, you have to go now. Because if your saturation is 87 and it falls below that, it's going to be very dangerous for you. So I said, no problem. He said, I should come to Kolobu. I said, no, I don't want to go to Kolobu because I don't like Kolobu. And my experience in Kolobu has, hasn't been good for some time now. He said, no, you don't worry, you come, because I am there. I insisted, he insisted. But as the doctors will always say, the doctor is more versed with patients' records than the patient himself. Or he. So I, I said, no problem. So myself, my security and driver, we drove to Colombo at 9 p.m. there. I was given a bed. Around 10, 10.30, they got me a bed. They admitted me. They put me on oxygen that night around 11 o'clock. By 2 a.m., my oxygen was finished. And uh, what happened in Kolebu is that the doctors come and leave you around 11, 12, midnight. And when they go, they will not come until 12, uh, 5 30, 5 o'clock the next morning. So you are all left to your feet. So when my got finished at 2 a.m., I was now making calls and calls. And the doctor they said that we don't have oxygen. But you know, there are two types of oxygen in Kolobu. There's one that is built in the wall. Those who are lucky and had, they got in first. They were put in those oxygen, the wall oxygen. That comes from the unit cell. Those of us who came and we are not lucky, we were given the cylinder oxygen. And the cylinder oxygen, there's a quantity of oxygen in that, that at any time it can finish. And when it's done, you stay like that. So 2 a.m., I made several calls for oxygen. I was there, no oxygen. The doctor himself came to Dr. Ba, Winfred. He's my doctor in Kolobu. He now rushed to Kolobu at 3 a.m., struggled to get me oxygen for that night until 5.30 again. 5.30, now the first nurse came in. Now they were now looking. Even when they got in, they, they, some cylinders were empty. So maybe two, three cylinders were lucky. Those of us who were lucky, we got the small quantity of oxygen that were left in the cylinders. 
And every minute they are bringing oxygen with cylinders. But they bring them half quarter cylinders of oxygen. So they won't bring a, a cylinder with full oxygen. When they bring in the cylinder, when you turn it on, it's quarter. It's half. What is this? And there are people charging for full cylinder. Now, for the next two days, three days, every midnight, 12, 2 a.m., my oxygen will finish. So my experience, my saturation started dropping from 87 down to 70. And the doctors will dress as if they are going to remove the patients. They will dress as if they are going, everybody is covered, nobody. I mean, that is not how the infection of COVID is. And nobody even wants to get closer to you. The distance is there. And then they will come. No drugs. You buy your own drugs. If you don't have money, you die. And the level of neg negligence there is high. No care, no monitoring. It's like having a big hospital without equipment. They are giving a, a military man uh, a gun without bullets. So I don't know whether it's from Kolobu or it's from the doctors or where the problem is. I don't really can tell. Because the doctors will say they don't have the resources. They don't have medication. You have to buy. They prescribe. You go and buy and you bring. You know, it's, it's sad. Middle of the night, the cry I hear there, I, I, I weep for my, not for, my, for me, but for people. You hear people crying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm going to die. My, everybody will be crying different too. I'll be sitting up like this, watching. Because my oxygen is done, it's gone. So I'll be breathing on my own. <sighs> Trying to allow my lungs to function. Three days solid, I wasn't mad. So from 87, then by Tuesday, Wednesday, I was now 70. So instead of me maintaining saturation of 90 or 91 or 92, or even the 87, now I went down to 70. And every night, I will have shortage of oxygen. Every night, every evening, every 2 a.m., my oxygen will finish. And I will sit like that until 5 a.m., until the next doctor appears, or the next nurse. So... If you, God is not on your side, you will die. You will just go. So my experience in Colombo was the worst one. And I, 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 must, I must be sincere. I think that Colombo needs a lot of resources. Colombo needs to be equipped. Because the doctors are good, the nurses are good, but they don't have anything to fight for your life. So you are there and you are left. It's like a death trap. You go and die. Go to Kolebu and die, and then they come and take you away. That's it. That's what I see Kolebu like. You go there and die. And then from there, I said, okay, in that case, I need to move to Tema. So we transferred, they transferred me from, I told my doctor, look, I can't stay in Kolebu any longer. My wife insisted that I must move out of Kolebu. An ambulance was sent from Ayman to pick me out from Kolebu. When the ambulance picked me, and we were on our way to, uh, we used the motorway to hurry and get to Kolebu. We got to motorway and we bust the tie. Come and see me lying in the ambulance. And every car coming was flashing their lights on me. And apparently the nurse and the driver didn't even know where the spare tire was because it's a brand new car. They got the spare tire. They were not looking for the two they could. So they have to run to the nearby community there to get boys to come and help. So we were there for the next 30 minutes. I called my brother. They were already asked to move to Kolebu. And my wife. So my wife and my brother were already in Aima waiting for me. So my wife has to turn back to motorway. Once she got to motorway, they were also attacked by armed robbers. So you can see the trauma, I, the experience. I went. We're there for the next 30 minutes. These guys did a fantastic job. The nurse and the, doctor, uh, the, the driver to get the tie fixed and all those boys around. And then we moved straight to Aima. When we got to Aima, when the doctor checked, my saturation he said, no, 70. It's 70. What are we going to do with 70 saturation? So quickly, they advised I go for scan again to check my lungs. And when they did the scan, I had 96% involvement of COVID pneumonia. 96 men I had only 4% to survive. All my lungs was blocked. The doctor shouted, wow. I think I set the record in Kolebu, uh, in Aima with 96%. Nobody. So 96 was so high 
that they were shocked. The doctors, she's a very honest and sincere person. She's the type of doctor, if something happens, she will tell you, look, master, prepare, you go home. So she said to me, look, you don't worry, we'll do our best. So my wife and everybody, they did their work. My wife did a lot of work. Prayers, prayers upon prayers. Ghanaians prayed for me, Muslim community prayed for me, the, the Christian community, they all prayed for me. A whole lot of people prayed for me. And I'm very grateful for the prayers. So from there, hmm, the treatment started. There was this Actamira injection they did. I think it was 9,500. Apparently they bought it for somebody. By the time the, the injection came, the person died. So when I got in, luckily enough, the injection was there. So they used it on me and it stopped the damage of the organs by the COVID because COVID attacks and it starts damaging your kidney, your lungs, your every, it just starts attacking every part of your organs and it will spread fast. So that injection stopped the spread of COVID to any part of my organs. And then they now started. Then they put me on CPAP, a CPAP machine. I think they are the only people who have the CPAP. Two of it, one gospel, one was left. And that has so much power, the CPAP. And when I was on the CPAP, then I started breathing normal. And then apparently I was told that anybody they put the CPAP would reject it. So a lot of people even push the CPAP away. I call it the Rambo machine. They just name it the Rambo machine, the Rambo machine. So that helped a lot in my recovery. But I would say that God's intervention, because even at the hospital, they were doubting whether I would recover because of my, the situation they brought. 70 going down to 60 saturation. That's very bad. So within two days, I started saturation at 90, 91, 92. So my recovery became very, very, very fast. And they were wondering, how? We're looking at a two-month recovery. But Ayarika recovered within 10, 13 days. And they said, look, whatever you are doing out there, continue to do it. God is with you. And how, how your prayers to God and your bond to God is very, very, very strong. I would say my recovery is based on God, the Almighty, but not mankind. I mean, I enjoyed my stay in Ima. Currently topical is a subject of a bill that is before Parliament. It's been described by the opponent of this bill, even though the proponent says it's supposed to promote Ghanaian family values as uh, anti-LGBTQ. Uh, it depends on whether you want to add the T, the plus, and the excesses. What do you make of the debate currently on this bill? First of all, I think that um Guardians and a lot of people only think about when they say lesbianism and gayism, it's all about the L and the G. If you look at it, it's beyond the L and the G. It has the L, the G, the T, the Q, whatever, and the plus. That is the dangerous, that's the most worst part of it all. It's not even the L and the G. The worst part is the Q, the T, the plus, and the, you know, it's, Terrible, it's a terrible thing to think of. Lesbianism and gayism. You know, I experienced this attitude whilst I was in Germany. I had a restaurant in Germany, and the community where I had a restaurant, that was their station, that was their, their camp, their area. The lesbians and the gays, that's where they were. And I had a restaurant there, so every day they come and buy my food and everything. So I've lived with them there in Germany for a very long time, and I know the attitude. There's a tribe I don't want to mention in Germany, and I would say they contributed to the gayism and the lesbianism. This tribe are Muslims, and they've come to settle in Germany. And their pride is that whenever their children want to get married, their children must prove that they are virgins. And if they are not virgins, they'll be sub the family will be subjected to radical and punishment. So their daughters, very beautiful daughters at that time, when you go out with them, they don't allow you to have sex through the normal way. Then they want you to do the abnormal way so that they will keep their virginity for their so-called husband who will marry them in the future. So that when that person marries them, they will see that they are virgins. They are virgins in front, but they are these virgins at the back. But bringing it to Africa, 
and the plus and plus and plus. Oh, I think that I support the bill. That's the first thing I want you to know. Secondly, I think, you see, people say that we need to have our rights. You, they don't give you a right to abuse that right. If I will give you right to abuse your right, then it's wrong. What is, the plus means that a man can marry a, a, dog, a dog. A dog can marry a woman. A man can marry a horse. A horse can marry a woman. I mean, where are we going? Are we human beings? Even dogs don't want to marry us. Animals don't want to marry us. Why are we subjecting ourselves into this ridicule of end of time? And we want people to say, that, oh, it's our right. Of, you think if we want to give everybody the right, we can live in this world? I'm Robert said it's our right to shoot and kill and take your money. Should we give them the power? Terrorists say it's our right to terrorize people and take whatever belongs to you. Should we give them the right because they can do it? So you see, the laws and regulations that we put in life is to regulate our behavior, our attitude, our manners, and everything of ours. And that is why we have law, we have regulations, we have the police, we have the military, and we have every part of an institution that governs us. We're told that elsewhere in the West, we're talking about Europe, America, um, LGBT has now come to say is a right that is now enshrined within their societal norms and their constitutions, even though their laws. We take budgetary support from them. Uh, they, we, we bring inv investors from there. We call them for foreign direct investors. If we're willing to eat with them at the same table, why not also follow through with their regulations and societal norms? Roland, let, let me finish before we get to them. Let me finish. I'm not done yet. And the plus means that too. One, that a child today can become an adult tomorrow. So what it means that we can now abuse our children. So a child can say, look, I am 10 years old, and today she can say she's 40 years old. So if she's 40, you can marry. So that means that you can marry your grandchildren. And a small boy can get up and say, oh, today I'm 17, I want to marry my mother. I'm 23, I want to marry my sister. I'm 30, I want to marry my auntie. So what it means is that no underage. I mean, let's, let's, let's think. Is it what people are for and say that we have right? Tomorrow you can put anything and then you are accepted in the society. What is it for? What kind of pleasure are we looking for? Because in some part of the world, some women can marry four men. Will they accept that? What is good for them? Let it be good for them. What is good for us? We, sh we don't need their aid in order to change our culture. We don't need their aid in order to change our skin, our tradition. We don't need that. Let them keep their resources. We have more, pr more pressing issues in Africa to deal with. What position do you want the political stakeholders to have on this? Even the president of our, of our republic on the subject, on this bill that currently has occupied the minds of uh, everybody? If I am the president of the Republic of Ghana, I will put my stand clear. I don't even need to wait. By this time, the bill would have been passed long ago. Because your duty as president is to protect the people and make sure we abide by the regulations and the laws and the tradition of our country. It's not for you to sit there and say, oh, this one, let's allow the people. No. You are directly involved in it. The president should come out with a statement and stand on the issue of lesbianism and gayism in this country. All presidents have done it in the past. President Mahama did it. President uh, uh, Atamil made his stand clear. What is the stand of President Nana Akufado? What is his stand on gayism and lesbianism? Because he's the number one citizen of our country and he must come out to speak. But the president said that it, it is not going to be within his reign that uh, homosexuality will be legalized in Ghana. He said that in a church in Kumasi, I believe. That's not enough? No, to say it in the church is different. He has to make a public statement. You know, the community, the, the, the gayism and the lesbianism community, they pushed a lot of money. You see, now what they are doing is that if you watch movies now, they are sponsoring a lot of movies. And that people have forgotten to see, to see the aspect of what they are doing. Now every movie you will see that there's an act, a portion where gays and lesbianism act. They sponsor all those movies. Now they've put up cartoons, movies too as well, 
to make sure that our kids learn it very fast. Economies variedly have now raised issues about fluctuating prices of goods and services. And you take a look at um, our, our ratio to uh, debt as well in relation to GDP, and it's a big concern for, for them as well. Uh, it's somebody who is a, a, a big stakeholder player within the political and economic landscape of our country. Are you worried at de debt to GDP ratio as well as the fluctuating prices of goods and services? or you read my manifesto, you realize that there was a point where I said, we needed to have a price guarantee system in this country. The price guarantee system give government the power and the authority to regulate the prices of goods and services coming into the market and going out of the market. So that nobody imports anything and just decide to put a price quotation on it without necessarily the government in power or the institutions to monitor and value that particular commodity to know the price of it. If you go to the market now, everybody decides to increase the price as when and when they want. People will just increase prices of goods and services at any time. One aspect that we've forgotten is that, Roland, we train a lot of economists in this country. We are touted as having one of the best economic students, the best economic vice president in the country, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. I remember very well my brother made so many noise when he was in opposition about the depreciation of the city against the dollar. And that when we don't produce, we import more. And when we import more, we spend more and our value of our city will go down. Now we have trained a lot of economists and they have not added value to our economic situation. Foreigners do business here and take away all the monies they make. Can you go to, if I come from Germany and I hold 20,000, I'm not allowed to bring it in. I hold the maximum amount of money I can take from Germany to Ghana is 10,000. But in Ghana, you can take $10 billion if it's only available and out and nobody cares. And we have the best economic vice president in the world. Look at the city against the dollar. Today, nobody is talking about that depreciation and that value for our cities anymore. Because it is skyrocketing. And everybody, even you, the media, you are quiet. Yes, the media, you are quiet. I don't know whether you have forgotten that Vice President Baumia is still alive. You haven't asked him those strong questions. When he was in opposition, these were his words. When he's in government, these are his words. But I want him to know that. Today, he's the man in control. I'm even told he wants to run for president. So if you cannot manage a city, how can you manage a country? We are borrowed to the extent that even our great-grandchildren cannot pay. We are not producing. We are not man We say one district, one factory. The fact is, how can you bring factories without raw materials? We are running to bring Falbe into Ghana. Where is that money? Who is the one sponsoring bringing Falbe? I want to know. Volkswagen. Who is the one sponsoring Volkswagen to come to Ghana? Because I know the Germans will not sponsor themselves here. Somebody is pumping some money to bring VW into Ghana. Who is the one pumping that money? And where is the money coming from? I am a German half. I know. The Germans will not pump their money into Africa. No. Unless Africa is ready to pay 70% of the investment before they will come to Africa. And if anybody thinks I'm wrong, somebody should come out and clear the air. That I am saying that the Ghanaian people are sponsoring 70% to 80% of our way to come to Ghana. Who is the one? And that amount of money is not in thousands of dollars. It's in billions of dollars. I tell you, it's not one billion or two. Who is the one sponsoring it? I want to know. With that said, um, what do you think all these observations you've made uh, are having on the lives of the ordinary Ghanaian. Uh, I remember the last time we met uh, in Boku when you were in the campaign trail back in 2020. Uh, the Ghanaian should be having a lot of um, hard times, you say? It's hitting them very, very hard. As you are aware, the moment you increase the price of fuel, every other commodity in Ghana will go up automatically. Now, you realize farmers this year couldn't produce much lack of the subsidy of the fertilizer. So what it means is that we are going to have shortage of food in the next year, in the next months to come. Now, that those who are able to produce, 
they produce it at a very high cost. Because the fertilizer they bought, they bought it straight from the director and the, the distributor direct or the supplier. And that has amounted to high cost of what? Production. So now, if you ask me what is going to be the economic situation in the next month to come, I'll tell you worse. Because we have shortage of food, we have high cost of food, we have high cost of uh, living, and we have increased fuel. So you should know that this government is not helping in production, manufacturing, or any, any form of industrialization. So the Ghanaian people are losing their jobs day in, day out. And if we are losing jobs day in, day out, how do you tax us to make money? I think that President Nanado should sit up. Uh, Vice President Baumia should hijack his color very well and know that there are problems, serious problems. And if he's vying for president, the first thing is to make sure that he solves the problems which he is vice president now, before he can even think of jumping up, because the people are suffering. People are building communities without roots. People are building communities without hospitals. People are building communities without water. People are building communities without light. So how are they going to survive? They are doing their part, and government is not doing its part. All that government does is to come and do politics and go away. So I think that we, uh, we need to sit again and thankful and grateful. But COVID is real. And uh, I think we need to intensify the education on COVID and create more awareness. And Ghanaians should wear their nose, uh, marks, nose masks to prevent them from having it. It's very expensive treating COVID. I have paid a lot of thousands of dollars to survive. Hundreds of thousands of dollars at cities. So I will entreat that every Ghanaian out there listening and watching should not see COVID as an uh, excuse to say that, oh, there's nothing. I wish to even take the lead and mantle to advocate for COVID uh, uh, vaccination, for people to be vaccinated against the COVID. So we're grateful. Stay calm. Wash your hands regularly. Wear your nose mask. Stay safe. Avoid uh, meeting people and keep a social distancing. I'm grateful for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you for speaking to us. And um, we've been having this interaction with Dr. Hassan Ayariga. He's a leader of the APC, but also presidential candidate. Uh, but uh, a, a, a critical um, aspect of this conversation was about his recovery from COVID, but also sharing his experiences on the current um, ongoing debate about LGBTQ+. Plus 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 if you want to add that as well and then also the impact of fluctuating prices of goods and services on the ordinary Ghanaian but you can get an upload of this we're talking about TV3 Ghana on Facebook Twitter Instagram and YouTube and also go look out for 3FM on their socials 92.7 that'll be it for now have a great time mm -hmm.